Welcome to another episode of Energy Matters interviews. I I can't even tell you how happy I am to to welcome my one of my oldest dearest friends, Harry Hart Brown. Harry is a actor. He's a, a movies and story and TV and also a storyteller and an incredible human being who has been producing these amazing videos called Holy Mackerel Moments. You should check it out on YouTube if you want to be thoroughly entertained and educated. Uh, Harry is, is he's, he's the brother of my heart. We've known each other since we were 16 or 17 years old and really have never stopped loving each other. It was <laughs> like we connected the first day at an at a acting, acting school and it just unfolded after that. So I'm definitely one of your biggest fans, Harry. So welcome to Energy Matters. Oh my God. I, I don't have many criticisms of your introduction. Because right before <laughs> you said, what do you want me to say? I said, oh, say whatever you want. It'll be fine. And uh, it was more than fine, Vicki. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Phew. What a relief. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want me to scold you now. <laughs> That was Edna May Oliver coming. To <laughs> so just to be clear to folks who are watching, Edna May <laughs> Oliver was one of my very favorite actresses when I was about 18, 19, 20, probably still is in a certain way. I even had a puppet character that I based oh. on her. She was somebody who was in the old movies, black and whites so of Pride and Prejudice. And she always talked like this. And <laughs> I just absolutely loved her. So we every now and then, Harry and I have to embody <laughs> her with one another. So that's a little it's secret true. invitation into our friendship. It's so Harry, I, I want to ask you. Can um, I say a little bit about Edna May? Sure, sure, of course. She was also a, had a prominent role in uh, David Copperfield. That's what it was, David Copperfield. Well, and also Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, she yeah. She was right in that too. She was in a lot. But um, the, she had a little patch of grass in front of her little house. <laughs> and in the opening scene, the donkeys of some neighbors come across. You off my green, off my green. Get the donkey off my green. That's all I had to say about it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for bringing her into the space here. So I want to begin by asking you, uh, um, when when I said energy, you know, energy matters, and I want you to do this, you had a little bit of like a yes, no, because you, yeah. you kind of went to a place. So I want to ask, first of all, what is it for you? What does energy mean for you? Is that part of why you got stuck is trying to define it? Or is it something else that got you to a place where you weren't sure you were ready to talk? Well, I've thought recently a little bit here and there about energy and i i remembered in the far recesses of my brain that i'd read a really interesting article about it and i wanted to brush up on it before i committed to coming on the show because i thought it would be a value to share the essence of it that that was part of the reason why i i thought harry if you do the show with vicky you better be prepared to speak intelligently <laughs> about energy and then another part of me said well harry everything is energy so you probably can't go wrong that that's probably what I would say too. <laughs> number two, door number two. Yeah, and I, I just want to say, um, you're the person in my life who has uh, helped me think in terms of energy, and you've given me just. I don't do qigong, but I remember exercises I've seen you do in classes and in your great book, Way of Joy, but also in the anecdotes you've told me about. They stuck because they were so interesting. For example, I'll try to synthesize it. And I, correct me if I got it wrong. There was a moment many years ago, you got hit by a car and somehow you knew to surrender and go with the energy instead of tightening and resisting. And then you went with it and you were a lot more fine than you would have been otherwise. Is that it's, it? Well, that's, that's yeah, that, that was, I, a, a, I could see a car was coming up really fast. And I just thought in that split second, I need to go in the same direction. My energy needs to go in the same direction as opposed to trying to block it. And uh -huh. so that's, I think that's part of what happened. But what happened beyond that was that once I was thrown, I was thrown up into the air because it hit me at about 30 miles an hour. And I had this moment, I don't know if I've ever even told you this, where I felt like I was a seed inside of a hull. Did I tell you this? Oh, no, I don't okay, recall. So I felt like I was a seed inside of the hull and the seed was located around my navel center, which surprised me. Somehow I would have thought it would be around my third eye. And I was looking around on the inside silhouette. I still remember starting the wow. inside of, my, of the silhouette and thinking, oh, I really am a seed in a hull. I could stay in this body or I could leave. And obviously I decided to stay. And when I, uh, but that was a time out of time. Oh, I mean, that it was, was like, your it felt life? Like a, 
yeah, the home just in this... like this lifetime. That if you left it, you would have left. Oh my right. God. Wow. Yeah. And then, and, and, and this moment of decision, I mean, I was actually pretty depressed during those days. And so it wasn't a given that I would even stay, but I decided, no, I will stay. And when I opened my eyes, I was coming into the pavement really fast. And that's when I tucked into a martial arts role. So that's, oh, that's, God. yeah. Yeah. So, so when you heard the story about me going, you know, going with the energy, what did that bring up for you when, when you had heard that first? Just keep it in mind in case I'm hit by anything. <laughs> handy dandy little, you know, nugget to have just in case. A tip for, for staying alive when you're hit by a car. Exactly. <laughs> like, stay alive. Except when we're ready to croak and then we do that gracefully too, hopefully. But there's well, so, a, Go uh, ahead. Well, I was just going to say regarding you and energy and the things I've remembered over the years, it's so funny because you you said instead of blocking it you went with it there was another instance where you did block it to another kind of beneficial effect because it was coming toward you in a negative way and you felt it and you did something energetically and the person approaching you who's probably not having your best interest in mind like boing bounce back <laughs> anyway, oh, that's that was, that's right. true that's true i was playing with something called way tea uh, but but when i was thinking about you as a, as an actor and as a storyteller and one of the things that you do so brilliantly again and again is how you embody characters. It's it's almost like you're a shapeshifter. Oh, when, thank you. When you go into these different characters and these different attitudes and these different voices and different body. I mean, it's just really extraordinary to watch you, to watch you shapeshift. And so mm -hmm. I was thinking that there's probably some kind of energy application in that. Like, I don't know what happens for you internally when you're changing into another character do you it's not a conscious process but the only thing that can trigger opening up to it is consciously saying to myself open up to it to the spiritual intuitive uh, powers that can be channeled through you i remember one time i um i was called to <laughs> i was called to read for the part of charles manson in a tv movie about the beach boys and apparently one of the head Dennis, I forget his name, but one of the head beach boys had had an interaction with Manson. And so that was part of the story. I thought, oh God. And it was like the next day. And I ran to the bookstore, got Helter Skelter. And it's like a million pages long. I want to do my research. I want to be good tomorrow. And I read it. I said, Harry, there's no, you'd be up all night long reading this. So I threw the book away and thought I would just meditate on it. So I did. And what came in was not like a demonic, evil, angry person. It was another facet of him that was kind of laid back and charming. And, and I used that energy in the audition the following day. But what I found happened to me the night before and the, uh, the audition the following day was I was hunched over and I walked a certain way. And I used that in the audition. She said, very good. And they ended up using a guy who was much more the mark physically. He really resembled Manson. Um, and okay, I gave it my best shot. Weeks later, I went back to the sides of the script and just, you know, going over, could I have done this better? Could I have done that better? And in the stage directions, which my eye had skipped over when preparing for the audition, it said Manson walks uh, slightly hunched over. And I didn't know that. But yeah. somebody did and gave it to me, you know. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. There's a way in which you 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 tap into that kind of extra extra outside of your body wisdom again and again. I, mm -hmm. I know that you have so so many stories, folks. If you haven't seen Holy Macro Moments, I can't recommend it highly enough. You'll get a lot of stories about about what would I call it? Something wow. about what is mysterious things that are mysterious. Oops, my necklace just went. <laughs> Palloon. <laughs> so, so it's own uh, life, which is kind of mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so there's one of these ghosts is happening right now. But there's a story you told me once about you were um, on stage and you had played a character that had died. Oh my God. Would you tell that story? Because I think this is such a, I mean, this talk about energy. This was an energy that came to oh you God. Um, in that moment. Thank you for, yeah, I, I was planning to make it one of the Holy Macro videos, which I probably will someday, but, but, Wow, thank you for asking me to do this. 
friend named Michael Kearns said, here's a script I'd like you to read it. I think you're producing, I'd like you to play Warren. I go, okay. Oh my God. It was about a, a perform performance artist in San Francisco who was charming and delightful, who died of AIDS. And this play was written by Rebecca, his best friend, like two to three months after he died. So a lot of the dialogue was practically verbatim, fresh from actual conversations they had had because she remembered them. That's why it felt so authentic. I went, oh my God, I'd be honored to play this role. Before rehearsals started, I had occasion to visit my friend Vicky De La Gioia. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't think you're in Oakland yet. I think you're in San Francisco at the time. Yeah. And we're in the car, you're driving to the airport, uh, I guess at the end of the visit. And we, you said, what, what's new? I said, oh, I didn't tell you about the play. I'm in a play. It's a, it's a real, it's about a real guy named Warren who died of AIDS and, and he's charming. It's a role, it's a beautiful, touching play. And he said, oh, that sounds great. Well, what's his last name? I said, John Stone. You said, oh, and where did he live? I said, well, he grew up in the Midwest, but he, he lived most of his adult years and he died here in San Francisco. You said, I knew Warren. I said, what? You said, I knew Warren. He was a friend and he did these shows. That was the first holy mackerel moment. You remember this? And oh, yeah. then when I got home, he sent me a photograph of him talking to a red cabbage and a zucchini because he, he, they were like his puppets. I mean, I wish I'd known him. He sounds so fun and funny. He was. He was very creative. Yeah. And you sent me a long letter of your memories of him. And you sent me an eight by 10 of his lover. And it's like, wow, how synchronistic is this? So that was the first thing that made it amazing. And then, then we rehearsed it and we were in the middle of our run coming to the end of the run. And I was in the seat of the character as far as lines went, like that was not a problem. Uh, so because I didn't have to think about what do I say next, that was far behind me. I was more open to being in the moment, in the acting. And on this particular night, it, it, there was an energy in the room that was kind of special because Bob Harbin was there. He was a casting director for LA Law and he'd always been really nice to me. And he, I think he compared himself to Peter Pan once. He said, you know, I love not growing up and I love baby bulldogs. And I went, yeah, me too, me too. So there's a sweetness in him. But the big thing was Rebecca Ranson who wrote Warren had flown in to LA to see the play. So for those two reasons, I was kind of heightened energy wise. I. I wanted to turn my nervousness into excitement and good feelings. So I did my best to do it before curtain went up. And as the performance progressed, I thought, I'm doing fine. This is great. Now we come to the last scene where I'm in a hospital bed and my family is surrounding me. It's um, my, my lover, my girlfriend, my stepmother, my father. And prior to this night, I had always played it very emotionally because I'm about to die. And here's my family crying and I'm crying and, you know, trying to suppress it, but not being successful. And that just felt appropriate to me. Well, on this night, during the performance, that scene I just described was beginning. <gasps> and because I was so relaxed, I felt this beam of energy enter my left temple and fill me up immediately. And I knew Warren was in me. Mm -hmm. I felt Warren's spirit was guiding me from that moment on. <laughs> and my whole interpretation changed on a dime. No tears, like I have now. No tears during the performance. It was a totally different vibe. As Warren, with Warren guiding me, I was looking at my, my stepmother's I'm sorry, his stepfather. I was looking at my mother's face, the character of my mother. And instead of going, oh, I'm going to miss my mother. I'm about to, I was very detached and intellectual. It's like, this is the last time you're going to see her. If this is her face. You better study it now while you can. And I began taking mental pictures of her crow's feet and the line of her jaw and her nose going, I never noticed that before. Why didn't I look before? Just studying every detail of her face. So that felt right. You know, it was very different, but it felt right to me. And uh, 
And the rest of the scene, I was kind of just taking a last look at everybody. And then I died. And one of the concerns I'd had up to this night was really appearing dead because the scene continues for a bit with me dead in the hospital bed. And I'd seen too many plays and movies where the eyelid would flutter or you'd see someone breathe a little bit. And I'd go, I don't wanna do that. So in previous performances, I'd always held my breath, <laughs> never quite long enough, but I thought it's the only way I can be totally still. But on this night, after I died, a voice said, um, you can breathe. In fact, you should breathe. Don't worry, it'll be so shallow no one will notice. So I let myself breathe and it was very shallow and I didn't feel like anything was moving on the outside. So I thought, oh, this is good. And I shut my eyes and I was in this peaceful void of darkness. And all of a sudden I saw my mother who had died three years earlier in my mind's eye with her back to me. And she was looking over her shoulder and there were these huge white wings springing out of her back like an angel's wings. And she had this mischievous smile on her face and she went, wanna hop aboard? And in my mind, I said, okay. And I grabbed the base of both wings and we whooshed up out of my body to the top of the theater. I went, oh my God. And I could sense the play going on beneath me my mother was right next to me at the top of the theater. And I went, I got to look dead now because I'm not in my body. Thank <laughs> you. <God. laughs> this is so cool. And the play continued out of the hospital room into the, fun <laughs> into the funeral scene. And the family and friends are gathered around. And in the last moments of the play, they begin singing Amazing Grace. And I'm kind of enjoying watching it. I go, oh, wow, this is so touching. <laughs> Shit. The play's about to end. The lights are going to go down. I have to be in my body for the curtain call. <laughs> I said, Mom, I, I could just feel her energy was so warm and enveloping and sweet. And I said, Mom, I love hanging out with you but I have to get back in my body for the curtain call. She said, I know, I know, go ahead, go ahead. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I knew it was in my body. The song ends, the lights come up, I stand up, we bow, and that's the end of the play. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Afterwards, you know, people hugged me, they're crying. They said, thank you. The author was there crying. Someone said, um, you know, thank you. That was amazing. And my God, when you die, you really die. Mm. I said, well, I never wanted to die on stage except in that way. And I'm glad it was successful. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much what happened. Wow. It's so, it's so incredible because there, I know that, you know, one of the things that you are as an actor is, you know, you're a master craftsman, you're a perfectionist, you're really, you know, you are honed into details and one of the things you and I have done over the years is give each other feedback on our solo performances and stuff. And I, right. I think both of us love it because we both love to just get in there and hear what is working and what isn't, you know, what is, what is it that's really, uh, the, you know, what's, what, what do we tweak? And, you know, there, yes. there's that, that part of it, which is, you know, the tweaking and the, the crafting and the carving and the, you know, making that happen. And then there's this other part that is what you were really just talking about, which is something that's, intangible right of like how like you said when you prepare for a character you just really look at how can this energy come through me you know what is it that what is it that i'm invoking what is it that i'm inviting and and just let welcoming it saying i i am that vessel um so it's this really wonderful balance it seems like between craft and magic or um the unnameable or the mystery right yeah. like how do we make these things come alive so that people can really feel it. Yeah, Agnes Moorhead um, said two things. And it's funny, I just realized this. Um, it was the one performance where I didn't cry in the death scene and the one performance where the audience was crying copiously. And mm -hmm. Agnes Moorhead said, as an actor, you start the tears, but let the audience do the crying because mm -hmm. there's something moving by the when the character's fighting it. You know, instead of blah, 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 although that can be very moving too, if it's done really authentically, like Sally Field and Steel Magnolia, she just went for it and it was like, 
it was incredibly powerful. But other times you can fight it as an actor, you know, and the audience will cry for you. I thought that was interesting. And the other thing she said about what you just said, the combination of technique and mental work and the ethereal letting it flow through you. Someone said, what's the most important thing about acting? She said, discipline. She said, but remember, once the train is on the tracks, then it can be free. Mm. Isn't that nice? So yes. simple. Yeah, you, you get the train. I guess it's the discipline that puts the train on the tracks. And then once you've yeah. done that, that goes out the window and you're just sailing. Along. Yeah. Yeah. In Warren, the, the, the tracks were set because we'd have weeks of performances. And so all the technical stuff was second nature. Now I could open up to the new stuff, which came through, especially that night. <laughs> Another thing that struck me about the, the the synchronicity or the coincidence of Warren was that, you know, Rebecca was Warren's, one of his very closest friends. And just coincidentally, one of, you know, he was a friend of mine and one of my closest friends ended up playing him. <laughs> so it was just, Jeez, right? I mean, th that, that was something that also had struck me about it. It was like, oh, of all people <laughs> that I would know to play that, it would be somebody that I've known since I was a kid and have you know, who love, love so deeply, uh, um, even during these times that we don't talk, there's still this, there's always this connection between us, right? This, yeah, this yeah. recognition of a uh, kindred spirit. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so, so for you, then the energy, there's energy, then that go energy in terms of just the crafting and preparing and, and the technical part of building a character or building a scene. And then there's the, energy part of infusing the life that has nothing to do that that, that, that the craft can just hold but that it's yeah. that it's it's breathing the breath of life into that character and you do it so brilliantly again and again i mean oh you were you, were, you, you know, do. <laughs> <laughs> you do too <laughs> have you seen her show have you seen her stories <laughs> so um what do you feel like um, is important for people to know about energy or how you think about how, you know, what, what do you feel like is a message? If you were to give people a message about how energy works, what would you say that is? I would give them, how are we for time, by the way? Do okay. I have, yeah. okay. Um, I would give them what I'm learning about right now. Um, the story, we did a story telling concert, Vicky and I together a few weeks ago. She told a very moving story about her mother passing. And the story I did was called Hoisting Up the Vibes. And that's something I'm just, you know, after all these years, I'm finally learning how to do it. How to, again, the technique, the conscious effort to say, get them up there. And then when you do it, then, then the magic can happen. And it really came home to me. I'll do an abbreviated version of Hoisting Up the Vibes because they're a few chapters after that, that you don't know about. Um, I realized we have the power to control our thoughts and feelings. And out of habit, I tend to go into uh, worry a lot and sometimes anger. And on this particular day, after three efforts to get this car repair fixed, it still wasn't getting fixed. I'm driving home, the light came uh, up on the dashboard again. I go, I'm going to spend my life at the damn garage, walking all day, waiting for them to fix it and come back. He says, it's fixed now. I go, thank you. Finally, drive home and it's not that. So, <laughs> so I was in that frame of mind and it was so bad. I, I stopped myself. I said, you're, you're over this, Harry. You're beyond this. You know better. You're not doing yourself any favors. It'll get fixed. Just change yourself. Change your thoughts. Get out of that anger now and think about something that makes you happy. I went, oh, thank you. What makes me happy? Well, it's the French Bulldogs on YouTube, Griffin Frenchie. They're adorable. I've been watching these two French. As soon as I started thinking about them, my spirit lightened. I felt better. But also, as soon as I started thinking about them, the voice on my car radio said French Bulldogs are very popular now. <laughs> what the? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I thought this is a high five because I hoisted up my vibes. I got a little sign of synchronicity. Later that week, I took my car to another garage. Another mechanic did fix it permanently. And he also mentioned he had a French bulldog. So I tell this story, what I just told you to a classroom full of kids. 
And they went, cool. And afterwards, the teacher walked up to me with his phone showing me a photograph of his French bulldog. <laughs> so I told this a few times and people said, well, Harry, they are very popular. I said, I know they are, but my <laughs> God, I think it's pretty old mackerel. I find so many in a row. <laughs> Thanks to our friend Jennifer, I got a, um, a screen call with someone for a podcast. She's in Brisbane, Australia. And we were having like a meet and greet on Zoom. And I told her all this stuff I told you, and there was dead silence, crickets. I thought she hated my story. She's not responding. I expect her to go, oh, wow. No, nothing. Finally, she, <laughs> finally she said, should I say it? I went, here it comes. The boom, about to boom. The boom, she's going to lower the boom. She goes, this is not at all appropriate for my book or something. So she says, should I say it? And I go, yes, what? She says, I have a French bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> what the? Oh, Wait, there's it. one more. Okay. I decided in my latest um, Holy Mackerel video, I would be open to donations to help support the channel because it's a lot of work and a little revenue stream would be very helpful. And I would uh, donate part of that to a wildlife rescue center, wildlife care center, which I talk about in the video. And so I don't know how to do donations. So I called PayPal and said, can you walk me through putting a link at the bottom of my YouTube video? She said, oh, I've never done that before. We can learn together. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But she was great and she was real smart and she saw exactly what to do and helped me set it up. I said, thank you. And she was so nice. I said, well, you know, the videos I do, they're called holy mackerel moments. And I'll give you an example. If you have a moment, she said, okay. And so I told her everything I just said, again, crickets. I went, oh shit. I went, oh no. <laughs> and, she, and she said, can I tell you something? I said, yes. She said, my son breeds French bulldogs. <laughs> I don't know when it's going to end. There'll probably be a French bulldog in my doorway. Saying, I expect that. I expect <laughs> to hear that absolutely in the next few weeks. <laughs> well, you know, it's that, you know, that that sense of um, the sort of law of attraction or whatever, yeah. this, this soup of energy that we live in that gets echoed again and again, and it's sort of like a unending mirror. Um, it's just a really, really beautiful, beautiful example of how that happens. And you just, you know, you are, you are an energy worker, you're magical with what you do with stories and how you do, you don't only ho hoist up your own vibe, for me, every time I watch you or hear you tell stories, it hoists my vibes too. I always walk away from conversations with you happier oh, and lighter. Definitely here too. Can I wedge one more thing in before we close? Sure, of course, of course, of course, yes. Oh. Uh, pertaining to the article I wanted to bone up on prior to this, I reread. Oh, right. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, Vicky, it's amazing. So uh, here it is in its essence. In the scientific world, according to this article, the magnetic grid that holds everything on Earth in place is gradually weakening. At the same time, the electronic pulse heartbeat of the Earth is gradually increasing. And when the magnetic grids weaken and the beat increases, what you get is ascension because nothing's being held down as much. In human terms, what is being um, held down are unreleased, unexpressed, stuck emotions. And there's a scientific term of when they put something in a, a container and they spin it, uh, that is also scientifically called ascension. And what's densest in the container is what rises first. And it said in human terms, as we're evolving and ascending, what rises first within us are our stuck emotions. They cause crimps in our energy field because maybe as a kid, we didn't feel safe letting them run their course through our body. So we, we trap them and they're stuck and it causes crimps in our energy field. And then we find ourselves attracted to other people with similar crimps like Velcro. And we go, rah, 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 rah. you know, we kind of work it out with each other or on our own because this highly refined spiritual light energy is 
purportedly entering our bodies and has been for a while, but it's it's increasing in intensity. And when it does that, it loosens up those pockets and those shadows and those dark, stuck emotions. So they begin to break up and surface almost on their own. So if we find ourselves suddenly angry with no apparent reason why, it might be an old anger that we never got to feel before, or we'll sob and not know why. That's releasing the stuck emotions and in feeling them finally fully, feeling them fully, we are releasing them. And that creates a void in our system, which is then able to accept more of that highly refined spiritual light. And that, you know, each time, we ascend a little higher. And when we ascend higher and we're more filled with a high, higher spiritual light, that's when we get past life memories coming more frequently. We get closer alignment with our intuition and our higher self. Our third eye opens up. We see spirits more. You know, all that cool stuff um, becomes more available to us. So it's a really exciting time on the earth and we see all the tumult that could be like a lance um piercing the boil so the toxins come up and out or the dark stuck emotions come up and out this whole mess could be part of the healing process and 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 simultaneously we're raising our vibes to get heal it get it out and release it and then get beyond it to a higher place of peace and happiness for all mm -hmm. Beautiful. What a beautiful way to end this. Thank you so much for that inspiration. And I, you know, may it be so, may it be so. There's a um, concept of chaos and reorganization that Priyajin huh. wrote about. It's, it's it's sort of in the same vein. Um, and I, it just seems so clear to me that that's so true. The more that we can uh, release that which is stuck, the more flow we have in our body, the higher the vibe. So, so yeah. Thank you so much, Harry, for this time oh. together. I love um, what you said in an earlier interview. Someone's asking you about what you wanted. And you said, um, I want to do all the work I can to change the world. And in my lifetime, please. <laughs> <hopefully, laughs> <hello? laughs> yes, come on. Let's get some going now. <laughs> so well, thank, thank you for all your yeah. fine work and oh. cherished friendship. Oh, oh, you you mean the world to me. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> It all. Thank you, Vic. So yeah, <laughs> listen, folks, if you if you enjoyed this, please check out some of the other Energy Matters interviews. Yes. Um, and I, uh, I I love you. If, you, if, you, if you're in the Energy Matters community and you want to talk to me and do one of these interviews yourself, just reach out. I love hearing from many people. So thank you all for watching. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.